You know I love football. I, I love football, and I was a quarterback back in my day. And I thank God, Bishop Matthews, you play football as well. But I want to allow him a few minutes to share with us, just share about what God's assignment for you. I want to challenge every leader. And I, I say this with all sincerity, not even uh, having any script, but I, I want to challenge all of us as adults, as, as leaders. God holds us accountable for everything that we do. He holds us accountable for everything that we say. But I want to challenge you to know that our children are watching us. And they're watching what we say and how we respond to life and how we look at obstacles and how we respond to others. It will make the biggest difference for the next generation as we speak life. And so today I want to yield this opportunity for Governor to just take a few minutes to share with us. Share what faith means to him on today. We're in a worship service. Come on, clap your hands for him as he comes at this time. Come on, help me celebrate him. We thank God for his grace and wisdom. I know what my grace is. <laughs> well, thank you, Pastor Pryor, Lady Pryor. I told him I know my place. It's here. It's here. It's not there. Uh, clear separation. Uh, Bishop Pryor, uh, thank you, and, and happy birthday to you and to the elders. Uh, I bring you uh, greetings from Vice President Harris, who's worshiping in Atlanta today on, on her birthday, on the Vice President's birthday. Um, my wife, Gwen, is in Nevada, and I am, I am grateful. Uh, to the folks here, uh, I have to say, uh, to the victorious believers, thank you. Thank you for uh, having a Minnesota Lutheran uh, with you in, uh, in, in fellowship and worship. But, but more importantly, it's very clear in this space. And uh, Pastor Pryor, I, the servant leadership and the sense of service to your community is evident in everything that happens in this space. And, and I, for one, am grateful. You are, you are living your faith daily uh, in this space, and I thank you all for that. Um, so a confession. Before I was a Minnesota Lutheran, I was a Nebraska Catholic. And... Um, I tell you that because you might have noticed we're kind of stoic people. We uh, we <laughs> we don't necessarily have our faith on our sleeve. But um, I've I've often said this, uh, Lieutenant Governor, and to the elected officials here. I'm grateful you're here, and, and we understand what our responsibility is. But I've often said uh, the folks don't need to hear a sermon from their elected officials, but they should expect us to try and live one. And. Um, <laughs> And for me, I, I hadn't done it often, but a couple weeks ago, I was in a little discussion with somebody who disagreed with where we were at. Uh, and I mentioned at that time when they were continuously denigrating newcomers to this country, I, I mentioned the one thing of my faith that was very central. It's uh, whatever happened in my uh, youth, uh, this, this sunk in. And that was uh, Matthew uh, chapter 25, verse 40. What you do to the least amongst these brothers and sisters, you do unto me. And there's a lot of life that can come out of that simple verse. Um, and I, for one, feel incredibly blessed. For one, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be on this ticket with Kamala Harris. And I, I've gotten to know the vice president. She tells a story. She tells a story when she was in high school. She had a close friend who was struggling, and Kamala asked her what it was, and it, it turned out that this young woman was being abused by a stepfather. And the Harris family, single mom, took that young woman in to give her a place of refuge and a safe place. And, and her mom, Kamala's mom, said, when you see something wrong, you have a responsibility to do something about it, to do something. And it, it seems to me that in that moment, that friend of Kamala's was the least amongst us. And Kamala was living Matthew 25, 40 in her life. And she talks about that being a pivotal moment for her. She went on to become a prosecutor, district attorney, and attorney general, and uh, United States Senator and Vice President, and can we all agree that she is the most qualified person that's ever tried to do this? I was just, just saying, that's a pretty good resume. Pretty good resume. 
we know there'll be folks trying to find a reason it's not but it, it struck me that um, in doing so she was living that gospel and she has one she talked about one client the first day as a young lawyer she walked into the classroom in, into that courtroom and and I say this as a teacher the same way she walked in there and she said Kamala Harris for the people that was her job that was her job be for the people and for me um, for me that stood out and then when we got to know each other um, she talks about how a kid from Oakland in a middle-class family with a single mom and a kid from rural Nebraska Butte Nebraska could be running for president and vice president she said we come from very different places very different places but she said Tim and I grew up around the same type of people middle-class people who looked out for their neighbors middle-class people who just wanted a fair shake middle-class people who knew right from wrong on how things work um, so I say that because when everything gets boiled down we we've got we've got an election that look I, I know many people if you say I'm tired of this um, trust me I am too um, we're fatigued we're fatigued from it but but when the burden gets heaviest that's when people start standing up a little straighter when they start wondering what needs to be done here and the choice in this is is not all the noise the choice sometimes just boils down to some of those simple scripture passages that tell us how to act and and I, and I just ask you and again I, I recognize the separation of the secular from our spiritual side but you can't separate what you learned and how you see people and how you care and how you worship from how you live your life. It's very difficult. It should be difficult. It should be difficult. If you're able to put aside what you learn in this space and go to govern and forget all that, I, I guarantee you're not going to be very good at it. Um, you're not going to be for the people. But I think about this one, about what's at stake. And I think you see t two very clear choices. You have someone who's trying to lift us up and truly bring out our better angels and bring us together and those that want to exploit fear and division and for me when I think about this my faith is very clear my faith tells me to care for the poor not to rig the system for the wealthy but to care for the poor it tells me to tend to the sick not to make it harder for those folks to get the care that they need and this one, it tells me very clearly to welcome the stranger if they're yourself, not to demonize them and make them feel unwelcome or unsafe. It also tells me, and we see it in here, to respect our elders, not to undermine programs that make life easier for older folks, make life a little bit easier for them. If you truly want to honor your elders, Make sure that we're supporting the systems like Medicare and Social Security that take care of them. That's the honor of elders. And I think as stewards of this creation that we have and the beauty of it, we have a responsibility to be good stewards, not to turn our backs and allow the destruction of the land, destruction of the water, destruction of the air, those things that we care about, um, that we are in God's creation, that it's our responsibility to be those good stewards. That's a, that's a distinct difference. And then I will say this. I, I think some of you felt, I myself, again, not speaking out on this, feel pretty uncomfortable with this idea that we understand in our faith the Bible is to be read and followed and absorbed. It's not to be branded and sold for $59. It's not to be. Not to be. Now, I say this not to make folks uncomfortable, but these are simply the reality we're against. And, and when I hear Kamala Harris talk, I would make the case that what she's proposing is her living her faith, which she learned as a young girl, that she's living the faith that you hear in this space of caring for one another. So she talks about a new way forward. Listen to the things she's talking about. She's talking about making sure our tax system focuses on the littlest and our children get off to a good start by giving a tax credit on the front end for those little ones, a child tax credit. We've seen this, and I will tell all of you, we did this in Minnesota, and what happened was is childhood poverty dropped by a third. And what that means is our littlest ones are healthy and safe in their person and can live the way they want to live. And you saw these incredible future here as this was happening. That's what we do. 
make life a little more affordable for folks. Talk about uh, making sure folks can have housing and different things. But um, and then she brought up something for I. I uh, did the happy birthday to the bishop here a few months ago. I turned 60, and I tell you, some of you in here, when you turn 60, you start learning about Medicare more than you ever cared about. You don't care much about it when you're young, but you care more. And and Kamala put out a proposal, and I want the folks here to think about how we see our parents. I got an 89-year-old mother who still lives by herself. I, it, it's wonderful. I live. I feel blessed. I feel blessed. But a simple proposal to have Medicare pay for in-home treatment and home care for our seniors so they can live in their homes. That, that's not too far removed from gospel there about caring for our elders, caring for those that are there. It also makes a whole lot of sense. Even if you don't care about that, it saves us a lot of money and folks stay in their home longer. So it's a, it makes sense. But I'll also say an acknowledgement of this and something Kamala's fought her whole life. Let's just be very clear. The abundance of this country um, we are truly blessed. But the system has put systemic barriers up in there where there are differences simply because of your race, color your skin, maybe where you live. We, we know that that's a reality. So I think for all of you, this idea of really focusing, and certainly in the black community, focusing on the things that matter, health. How is it right in the richest country in the world that two babies born at the Saginaw Hospital if one's a white baby and one's a black baby, the white baby's going to live longer because the way the system is set up. They're going to be healthier during their lives. You see these folks here. It doesn't have to be that way. And Kamala Harris is saying it's time for that to end and provide the opportunities to make sure it ends. And again, if you take those two babies, the chance that the white baby is going to own a home is greater than the black baby. Not because they are work anymore or because they're any smarter, or they've done the right things, it's because the system is set up to make it more difficult to do that. That is true. So when Kamala Harris is talking about down payment assistance on housing, making sure that we understand all these years of putting a disadvantage, if your family owns a home, that's generational wealth. And that's something that breaks the cycle of things that we've seen, and giving opportunities, and lifting up. And making the case, especially to black men, black men are not broken. Black men are, are, are thriving across the country. If we make the system, if we make the system fair, we're going to see that. So I think when Kamala talks about this, she's willing to take on those hard things. And I think, again, I would tell you this, a lot of this is golden rule stuff. Do unto others, you know the one. I said, we have an addendum to that in Minnesota that's mind your own business, too, on some of this, that people are pretty concerned about this. But the do unto others. It's not about tearing people down. Kamala talks about this all the time. Leadership's not look at how small and how many names you can give to somebody. It's about who you lift enough to give an opportunity. And I've said this and she's said it, strengthening things. I was 19 when my dad died. My little brother's in elementary school. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. We had medical bills that we couldn't pay because he went through lung cancer. It was at that point in time, people who came before me, my community, all of you, we're there for Social Security survivor benefits that protected that family. So what Kamala knows is so many times, people tell us, well, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We didn't have any boots. Once we got the boots, we're glad to do it. And in a lot of these things, the system is set up not giving boots to some people. So it seems pretty simple in this country, if everybody gets a chance to succeed on the same level and making up for those systemic and historic differences, we start to make more progress. And, and I tell you this, and I'll, I'll close with what I think is powerful about where we're going. And we know we got a long ways to go. But there's a speech that was given in American history that many people I don't think know about. They oftentimes talk about, and rightfully so, the Gettysburg Address, talking about who we are. This speech was given on a little rock in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in the heart of World War II. And the place was Iwo Jima. And American Marines fought one of the bloodiest and most difficult wars in that, fights in that war. And after that war was over, or after that battle was over, the sea literally ran red with the blood. And there were dead Marines scattered across the island. And what you do in the military is you get the chaplain 
to say prayers over the dead. They couldn't find a chaplain that they found acceptable because on that island there was only one and he happened to be the first Jewish chaplain. And in America, those that died on those beaches, those black Marines, they couldn't even go in restaurants or go to schools. But they were fighting for everybody's freedom. And there was great concern, why is a Jewish rabbi praying over the bodies of Protestants and Catholics? Well, at the end of the day, Rabbi Roland Gittleshin gave what I think is the most powerful testament of what we're striving for to be as a nation. This is a portion of what Rabbi Gittleshin said, as think about this, a day of dead scattered across the beach, the ocean running red, great concern about whether this should happen or not. How do we say this? Because the prejudice and the discrimination was strong even in that moment. And here's a clip of what he said. He said, here in this place, no man prefers another because of his faith or despises him because of his color. Among these men, there is no discrimination, there is no prejudice, and there is no hatred. Theirs is the highest and purest democracy. Everything gets lost in political campaigns, but at the end of the day, striving for the highest and purest democracy where everyone is valued for their spirit and lifts them up is what we're trying to do. So I would just humbly ask all of you, let's pass that torch to Kamala Harris um, that you are passing up here. Let's, let's, let's bring back compassion, decency, empathy, and, and try and live that sermon a little more than try and give one. Let's try and talk to our neighbors that it doesn't have to be like it is. It can be the sense of fellowship when we gather here. It can be the sense of decency. And there's plenty to go around that we don't need to leave some folks behind. And we don't need to leave some folks out. There is a real opportunity here. So I would ask all of you, first and foremost, thank you for allowing me in this space. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for considering what we can do together in how we live our faith and how we uh, how we run our elections and, and I have to tell you the privilege of being part of a democracy is something that billions of people around the world could only dream of and I truly believe this is our opportunity to preserve that democracy it's our opportunity to make it pure and to make it better it's our opportunity to make sure everyone's included and I think people of faith across this country truly understand that so um, pastor thank you for giving us a space to each of you um, however you see fit however you end up doing it cast that vote on November 5th it, it is a right and a privilege we need to exercise so thank you from my sister state another great lake state amen